we have heard at Share uh, a lot of hand wringing and teeth gnashing over the need for a next generation of people who are ready to step into the positions that are open. Uh, certainly that's something uh, Jeffrey and Cameron are talking about as well, is the need to train the next generation uh, to operate these systems. We've also heard uh, during our presentations that some of the uh, components that we're talking about here require a lot of very, very high-end knowledge to get everything up and running. Um, my first question for the panel is, is that a fair statement? And I'm going to go to the, some of the uh, more experienced members of the crew. In fact, I'm going to start with you. Is this a fair statement? Is there a skills gap in the mainframe space that needs to be addressed? Um, it's, I mean, it's a great question, and I'm not going to give you a straight answer, um, simply because I think it's a lot more nuanced than that. I've, uh, and if you look at it at the organization by organization perspective, you'll get a completely different answer from one organization as you will from another. Um, and that's simply based on what level of strategic enlightenment they've reached in terms of how they resource the things that they need to do in IT. Um, and so one thing that immediately crops up is this is not a mainframe specific discussion. Uh, the mainframe is an interesting uh, domain and, it, and it's certainly not without its um, challenges. But nevertheless, if you talk to, and I, you know, and I do regularly, I talk to organizations, they say, we haven't got a skills problem. What are you talking about? We've got a brilliant apprenticeship and training program that we've had in place for a number of years, and I don't know what all the fuss is about. Equally, there are certain organizations that, that just have not that reached that level of enlightenment, by which I mean they have not established that level of investment and rigor and management oversight, which means that they've fallen behind on the skills. And of course, the mainframe environment and the applications that run in that have outlasted anyone's reasonable prediction of their, you know, their tenure. And so those challenges will exist and they will come to pass at some point in many organizations because actually those systems are just more successful than anyone ever thought they would be. And that I think is the microcosm of the skills um, discussion. I don't necessarily think it's a crisis though. Um, it's only a crisis if you've let it become one. That's my view. Yeah, I, the conversation, I would ask Derek, I understand the companies that he's talking about have a clue. There are companies that have a clue, but those companies, and, and correct me if there, there, there are rare exceptions for the most part, those are big, huge companies like Bank of America, Broadcom. I've been in this space since 2005 and Bank of America saw this coming. They did, they saw it coming years ago. And um, I don't know why everybody else didn't until I saw that Bank of America was sinking on a lot of dough in this. Now, you, when, you're, when your question, St St Stefan is, about skills, skills crisis, depends on who you ask. Ask the IRS, ask Social Security. Oh, ask the state of North Carolina. They can't find anybody and they need people. And people are retiring every single day. So for them, and I agree with you that it, there is not really a skills crisis because Jeffrey and I have kind of solved the skills crisis, but there's, there's not one. There's not one if you got a billion dollars, not right. one, right? right? But if you're a small stuff shop, you've got to come up with some, some money. Yeah. And so, I want everybody to understand the federal government has already solved this problem. They didn't realize it, but because they've got more money than anybody and they're willing to put in as much money as they need. And they don't, they don't realize this, but that's what they're doing. They're going to put as much money in this as they need to, but they need people that understand what needs to happen. That's people like you, me, Jeffrey, Darren Search. We know we can address this. So, but there is, there is going to be a skills problem if, if somebody doesn't get a clue about this. There's going to be a skills problem. That's my take on it. I agree with that. One of the things that I find hardest to, uh, to get a, a basis of is what companies really need out of the education that I can provide at Northern Illinois. Yeah. You know, they're only in two semesters, which is what I teach my mainframe courses in. There's only so much I can do. So I have a lot of companies come to me say, you know, I want my my junior members, my new grads to do CICS and DB2 SQL. Oh, well, DB2 SQL. I don't have time to teach that. Good luck. 
NIU used to have a full semester COBOL course. That was the first language everybody learned, of course, back in the 80s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. But now it's C++, which is great. But they took away that full semester course, and now I have to teach COBOL in my upper-level mainframe course in about six to eight weeks Same of here. the 16-week semester. On top of that, they learned JCL basics. They learned how to write their own JCL for the three common modules, the high-level assembler, the COBOL compiler, and the binder. And then I do uh, external sub-programs and linkage. And I, that's about all I have time to do. Yeah. But what I'd really like is maybe some type of a survey to say, this is what we need as companies, and try to come up what with some type of I think, I assimilation think of that, that so that we know what in the world to teach. That, that is... But but I don't really have a problem with that because I just, I just go to hiring managers and say, what, what skills? I don't worry about critical thinking. Don't, don't give me the high-level fluffy stuff. Tell me what do they need to know mm -hmm. coming in the door. Mm -hmm. And so I get That's what I try to do. Yeah, that's, yeah. What I, that's what I get that. I get that. Now, but it needs to be much more refined because the, the, the way we have it set up in college, it, it is not commensurate with, with training mainframe. Mm -hmm. What we do is, is so in-depth and so requires so much time that it just doesn't fit into a normal curriculum. Right. So, you know, and I'm, I'm going to push our apprenticeship program nonstop. I mean, we, we have solved that problem. We, we know how to train mainframes. So how to get this in, in the do, how to replicate what we do in a four-year degree program, I, don't, I can't tell. I don't know. I mean, I definitely can't do it in East Carolina. They're yeah. not going to give me another semester class. Yeah, I, I wonder, too, is, is um, you know, uh, how many of these programs are there? And if these programs are turning out enough people. No. <laughs> okay, so, so, okay, well, we got an answer there. No, no, no. Um, so, given that, then, um, I, I can see two paths forwards on a skills basis. Either we can try to invest in more training and more skills, or we can try to normalize and modernize, you know, the, 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 the mainframe as part of the modern application stack. And to me, I think that sounds more, like, more future-proofed. Essentially, um, we can give up the notion that the mainframe is dead and embrace the notion that mainframe is definitely not dead and is going to be one of the components of the modern application stack. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we're at. And this is not a weird side cul-de-sac of compute, but this is actually part of the main superhighway of compute. I mean, do I have an amen on that one? Amen. Yeah. amen. But now, amen, amen. But my colleagues, my beloved colleagues, Misty Decker comes to mind, maybe uh, Derek to a certain degree, they, they give me the impression that they're convinced that we can do everything with the new and the cool. I don't think you do everything. No. Matter of fact, I know you can't do everything new and the cool. You've got to go old school. And so to really learn mainframe, you got to do, have the foundation. Now, after that, VS Code, IDZ, I'm, I'm good with all of it. Yeah. I need them to know how to log on with TSO, uh -huh. how to create a job with ISPF, right, uh -huh. and run that job in JCL. Uh -huh. Now, once they can do that, have at them. Well, this is revealing another problem, too, in that all of the lingo is entirely different. Um, you know, Jeremy? Yeah. yeah. Well, no, I'm just agreeing. You can yeah. continue with what you're saying. <laughs> no, I, yeah. What, what do you, okay, so so you're coming at this from a new perspective, from a, a perspective of somebody who, who is native, cloud native, DevOps native. Um, what is your reaction to hearing all this? So I started doing mainframe stuff like late 90s at Hallmark, like cars just down the street. Um, and it is real that they're like, uh, I'll say, I'll say the, the general world moved past uh, the, the new and the cool, uh, moved to that, yeah, where it, it is, you know, oh, it's, it's, not, it's not as cool to, uh, you know, mess around in, in TSO and, and, and do those jobs and, you know, do that stuff. That wasn't uh, because the general day-to-day -day user uh, moved past the command line. I get it. And, and I now I love the command. Like I go to a command line whenever I can to do, because I, I still, it gives me the warm fuzzies. And this whole presentation, you know, before just gave me the warm fuzzies of like, ah, this, yes, I remember here. this. Same here. Uh, but I think as we, we move into it, when you think about the lingo, I like that, that was the first thing I responded to, you know, I think visually was we create so much of a, um, 
a barrier to entry when we have uh, when we assume everybody knows the lingo when we're when we're talking. I mean, that's just we do, human nature. We do that. It, yeah, and that happens in every, every literally it doesn't every field. Cloud. Native doesn't matter yep. if it's you know sports. Doesn't it's all that way. It's so like figuring out from a developer. When I come at things from like the developer kind of operations side of you know their their experience, the onboarding. What's it What's it going to take to get there? And it's like kind of my mantra is you've got to like recklessly remove any barrier that helps to get someone to be successful. Uh, so I think part of that is like that beginning. Like let's let's change the conversation from. Uh, I mean, you still got to have the conversation around mainframes, but start to reframe. Uh, why the skills for JCL and TSO, why that stuff matters, uh, that then can be, okay, now how do we frame this into uh, why does it matter for, uh, you know, in cloud native? Why does it matter for, uh, you know, the other other things that we can try and bridge this gap? And I think what Popup talked about, like, really kind of, I think is one way to help that to get that, oh, okay, this is how this can work and here's how it can enter into the pipelines and like the thing, the newer DevOps cool things that we talk about and have for the last 15 years, how does that all relate? Uh, and I think that's an important message to, to do. But I think, I think each different organization, coming back to what Derek said, will have different requirements Ooh. and not just the end users or developers, but think of the software vendors. Where do they get the developers from? But where do they get the support stuff from? Because all this Zoe and ZOSMF and everything is fabulous. And it runs on the mainframe. My team use it all the time. Or I say to them, what happens if it breaks? Yes, it's going Re to. Remember, remember, you've got to be able to still interact with this thing. Yep. Yeah. Right. And it may, we may say yeah. command line, but really TSO, ISPF. But you might be SSHing into the mainframe. You might be FTPing into the mainframe. You've got to understand that. And I, back in the UK, we have we have a, a need to grow what we call pointy-headed techies, mm -hmm. like real bits and bytes people, because our customers come to us when things break. We don't, yeah, the one thing we don't do is development. I loved all of that <laughs> from Gary on the pop-up mainframe. And I'm thinking how I could pivot that mm -hmm. to use that as a training vehicle for some of my systems programmers to yes. give them the ability to go and write some code and run it. And if the mainframe goes, it doesn't matter. Give them a safe space to fail. Yeah. And I could see that pop-up mainframe pivot that. But I say to my folks, learn the command line stuff first. Yeah. Okay. Understand what the commands are. And then to make your life easier, use all the UI stuff and get that done. Because once you're there and you understand how it works, if it's suddenly taken away, yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes IT changes go wrong. Oh, CrowdStrike, um, you know, and you might do a mainframe upgrade and suddenly ZOSMF is not there. Well, how do I install my software? How do I fix this? How do I do that? So we have to grow techies and we've got a two year, it's a two year course, but they are productive after six weeks. And then we take them all the way through Love and then we give them right at the end, the one course they all hate machine coding assembler. I teach them assembler because, because once they can do that and they understand how the mainframe works, when somebody says, this is broken, they say, where's the slip trap? Where's the dump? Let me take it into IPCS and do what I need to do. Yeah, There aren't enough of those people. And so we, we, we're having two every single year. I'd love to have four. I'm trying to convince my finance director for more money so we can invest more in the team and get more in. But our age demographic in the business, we're about, what, about 40 people. I'd say 55, 60% of them are under the age of 30 now. That's great. That's what we need. That's yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, but you bring up actually another really interesting point. So um, in, during my career in IT, I've watched the um, availability or lack of availability of an environment to work in mm -hmm. as a big challenge. And certainly one of the things that really helped uh, my field of Unix systems administration was the availability of Linux. As soon as Linux came out, uh, suddenly you had people who were able to have their own Unix system. Before that, let me tell you, I have quite a story of how I got my Unix system in the pre-Linux days to learn on. Um, but now anybody can. 
you know, that's one reason that Windows took off was because people felt that they could use it. They felt comfortable with it. Uh, I think that that's one thing that's been ho holding back things like uh, network engineering, for example, because it's difficult for people to get their hands on, an, on, a, on a Juniper switch or a Cisco switch. And as soon as they made virtual versions of that, then, then it opened the door. And the same with, with mainframe, honestly, I mean, you know, how is somebody going to get their hands on this? I know, you know, Gina, you've got experience with this making, um, you know, network switches available to people. Uh, you know, wh how do you react to the availability of, of, of technology? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's a big thing. I'm actually chatting with Chris Evans um, on LinkedIn as we're talking about it. He's making the, yeah. Different Chris Evans, yeah. Chris Evans, that's what I told my mom. I'm talking to Chris Evans in England today. <laughs> she cracks up. But um, he, he's got the same, he's got the same, going down the same uh, thought process that you are. He's basically said, we could solve the skills problem if IBM would make, uh, let us install test systems. So like, just like you're saying, if we had someplace available to play in, uh, like, how am I going to get on a mainframe? Because I, you know, I learned assembly, I learned COBOL, and then I went to storage. That's who hired me after college, you know. And so I was post 2000, I graduated in 2001, post Y2K. So I went straight to um, storage systems, which I think, the, we were talking about this yesterday, I think that education helped me at least survive and keep my head above water when I was learning storage systems in the very beginning. Um, but you, you, you have to be able to break things to learn. You, I've got a lot of educators here, right? That's how you get the very technical people is they have someplace where they're very confident that if they grew up, they're not going to break an entire mainframe. Yeah. And it's, it's going to be okay. No data is going to be lost. Things won't be broken. But I, I think Chris's point and the point you're kind of making is, is related to IBM a lot. Because if you think of all the things we have in tech, because IBM was so closed, we have Ethernet, we have Unix, and we have open systems. We have all of that because IBM from the very beginning has been very closed door, not and very ultra proprietary, not wanting to share. So maybe the, they're, they've created this problem themselves being because of their business practices. Well, I mean, okay, I like what you said about um, the, the front end. Correct me if I want. I want to understand the context of the conversation, but I, but I, my inference for what you were saying was that what he needs to do is an impediment to, to, to you getting people. What he needs them to do is an impediment, right? So I want this, I want this entire conversation to be in the context of I've got last count three hundred applicants for mainframe apprenticeships. Most of them, all of, none of them know what a mainframe is. None of them have ever heard of JCL. None of them have ever heard of Assembler. They're hungry. And out of that 300, I'm sure we can find 50 or 100 that, that are commandos. Because all this takes, this doesn't take any background. This takes dedication and commitment and self-confidence. That's all it takes. Perseverance. So, and, and, and about the, about the um, access problem, we've, Jeffrey and I, it, a lot of things we say may sound like bragging, but we've actually solved that problem. And so we've got Barton Robinson allows us to use a guess that we have complete control over. We can break it. We can do whatever we need to do it. And that, I mean, that's all we need. And we can, we can scale that as much as he'll let us, as much as he, his resources allow. So mm -hmm. that problem's gone. But now I'm not, I'm going to push back on the skills issue. And I'm, I'm going to push back on, we need to just sell the mainframe to young people. No, the only thing we need to sell the mainframe to young people is that this is a future. That's all we need to sell. Oh, that, that, that this has a future. And I think yes. that's, the, that's the key. So, so Marion? I agree with that. I don't believe that the cool can solve the I found gaps. that not to be the case. Uh, because there is skill gaps even in the new tech, in the emergent oh, yeah. tech. So we're not going to be able to solve it that way. Nope. Uh, but I do think there is an image problem with the mainframe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So more marketing around, hey, it's the mainstay, it's the backbone of what yeah. business runs off of, is what needs to happen. And here's, the mark here's all the marketing needs to happen. Find a couple of thousand hungry, smart people and say, this is your future. And, and convince them of that. That's it. It's done. That's all the market you need to do. You don't need so, to. So I agree with that. And I hear him say that we can have people up and running in six weeks. Yeah. And so how do we make that sustainable and just literally pick it up and carry it to the next town, the next country to start this as a movement globally to start addressing? Uh, are these I'm people open. coming from nothing? Are they coming from? We, a, we, we've, had, we've had really good success with a whole range. So okay. in the UK, End of 
what we call senior school, high school is 16. So we've taken 16 year olds who've, who've, who've been good at math or, so I look for two attributes, very similar to you, Cameron. Mm -hmm. I look for attitude and aptitude. Yeah, I, it, I don't matter where you come from. I don't care. Yeah, whether it's you, more attitude than aptitude. It, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I I'll, 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 I'll love purple hair, tattoos, earrings. It doesn't matter. That attitude drives that. Nothing. Yeah, it drives that. Absolutely. Yeah. So we've taken sixteen-year-olds. We've taken eighteen-year-olds. So in the UK, sixteen, two years of college, and then if you want to, then you go and do three or four years at university. And we've taken them all the way through. But we had a young lad turn up at at our place with his father for a yeah family day. And we were just chatting. He was 15. Mm -hmm. He left school at 16 and joined us. He knew more about mainframes than some of the folks in the building because he spent 12 months just working and researching. There you go. Now, okay. he caused me all kinds of problems because he was so good. We actually couldn't promote him right. fast enough. Yeah. Because how do you make somebody who's 18 a team leader of a bunch of 40-year-olds? It's very challenging. <laughs> yeah. And that's... For, so both, we, for both sides. Yeah, yeah. So we... we have, we, though. Yeah, we, oh, we had... He, and he's still with us now. And he's, we moved him into software development where he's just got... Yeah, he's got his own mainframe to play with and he writes code. But he does... He does... He does C. He does Python. He does Assembler. He does... Wow. And we go and sit in a room and draw a picture and we say, Nathan... Here's what we've got here. This is where we want to get to. This is where we. This is how we think we'll do it. He said, "Leave it with me." I don't think you should have mentioned his name. I'm just going to say. Oh, he knows. There, there's going to be some inbound uh, recruiting going on. There. <laughs> not a chance. <laughs> that relationship is solid. That he's not worried about it. You're not worried. No, about no, I'm not worried about him so, at all. So, so where are we at now? So we've been talking about this for half an hour now. What do we think of 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 the skills gap? I mean, one of the. I think I got to say one of the things that I heard mentioned here, and I don't want to get glossed over, is that this is not a mainframe problem. This is an IT problem. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, John, I mean, you've seen this in all of the various fields of open systems that you've worked in. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, Gina, I know that you've seen this in networking. I know that you've seen this in storage. Uh, you know, we were hearing about, you know, how people need to debug assembler code. Hello. You know, we worked at EMC, uh, you know, and with yeah, EMC. Yeah. We know that that's <laughs> one of the biggest challenges in storage, too, is because, you know, a lot of this stuff is pretty low level and you need uh, developers who can do some real low level stuff. That's not a mainframe problem. Mm. Frankly, none of this is a mainframe problem. No. Uh, or is it? I mean, what do you think? I don't think so. It's a computer science problem, right? And this is even if you look at things like AI, which is the new buzzword right now, it's a it's an evolution, not even an evolution, it's a continuation of computer science that started before I was born. Mm -hmm. So this is everything, it relies on something else. And, and the mainframe has never gone away. The data gravity around mainframes is not allowing mainframes to go away is one of the things I think. But it, it's, it's about data being put into applications, being made use of by the entire world so we could create information. And it, it, all of these things are part of it, and it just needs, um, I, I think, whatever people can find a job doing. We just need the people with the venture, oops, I knocked my thing off. The venture capitalists just to chill out. Let's figure out what's the best thing to do in every situation, and let's just get to work. Yeah, so, but so actually, I want to give Derek the last word because this was your suggestion of a topic. So um, we've had we had a talk, we've had a conversation on this. Uh, skills gap, do we have the tools to fix this? Yeah, no, absolutely we do, categorically so. Um, but but you, you need the tools, uh, you, need, you need the sandbox, you need the sandpit environment, you need, you, know, you need people to learn in a place where they feel safe to learn. Uh, and that's true for, you know, for the, the youngest kids at school, uh, just as much as it is for IT grads. So, um, you know, that, that's never changed, but that has been defunded and the mainframe has, seen, has been seen in the past as something of an island. It sits over there. You know, the people work in the different departments, maybe a different building, maybe a different city. You know, these are, these are not good things for a, an inclusive approach to IT skills acquisition. Um, but I think I would also, you know, more fundamentally, perhaps more philosophically, I don't think it's an IT problem. I think it's an HR problem. Any organization that is big enough to say, right, our core product relies on our ability to continue to build that product and to sell it. Well, what are the skills we require? You know, the, the, the raw materials and the skills to assemble the thing that we're building. 
Well, if that's IT, you need those skills both today and not next year, but next decade. Mm -hmm. And you need to be able to plot your evolution as an organization. And I'm not sure that many of the, even some of the largest organizations um, that we could speak of here as examples, I probably won't because I don't want to get taken to court. Um, <laughs> I don't think they've thought that through well enough. Mm -hmm. And like I say, like I said earlier on, most of those systems over which they still preside have outlasted anyone's reasonable expectation. Mm -hmm. So it means there's an almost existential challenge facing some of those systems because those resources have not been invested in properly. And it's, it takes smart people like Mark, you know, with what he's doing in his rel relatively modest organization, but it's a good example just to say, right, we need to cut through the noise. We need to do, we need to invest properly in our people going forward. And that's what everyone needs to do. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, so I will wrap up this uh, discussion of skills with basically just a, a thought for those of you who are watching this, um, you know, the mainframe is not dead, far from it. The mainframe is not going anywhere, far from it. And if you have these skills, you can command a very good salary with a very stable career at one of the biggest and most important companies on the planet. Uh, so, you know, maybe uh, think about that. Um, so thank you for watching this uh, Tech Field Day Roundtable discussion live from SHARE in Kansas City 2024.